We're filming for the Hamilton College Jazz Archive. My name is Monk Rowe, and we're honored to have with us a man who's had a huge part in the two greatest jazz orchestras. Welcome, Grover Mitchell. Oh, well, thank you. Thanks for having me. Can you possibly describe to me the, that tempo that you did jumping at the Woodside to end that concert? <laughs> Fast. Fast. <laughs> Off the metronome. Oh, yeah. I yeah, was, it's... Uh, uh, you know, this is one, one of the success factors about this band is our ability to handle the extremely fast and the extremely slow. If you, you know, if you yeah. can remember Little Darling and, right. and those things, how slow we played those things. It's almost a tradition with, with the Basie band to be able to generate excitement and swing, but so soft and, and oh, yeah. slow. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. That's a, that's a lesson that, uh, well, this band is kind of an apprenticeship <laughs> for somebody like me. I've been in and out of this band for about 35 years, in one capacity or another. Mm -hmm. Most of my time I spent as a lead trombone player. Then I came back in 1980 and when the old man got sick and I was kind of, I was helping him. Yeah. I, mean, I was playing, but at the same time, you know, I was kind of his hands and arms and legs and, and I had to even help him think, you know. Yeah. Because, you know, he'd had a couple strokes and all right. that and he, and he could get a little bit you know, that dementia that goes along with uh, right. older people mm -hmm. having strokes and everything. So it was interesting. You know, it wasn't to me that I did so much for him, but I learned so, I learned so much having to behave like that, you know, with him, because he, mm -hmm. he was a great man, yeah. you know? You'd have to be around him to really find, you know, he was, he was, he was a great man. Yeah. yeah. He was a naturally great man. I should explain to our viewers that you have taken over the Basie Band with us about Eight months now, is it? About, about nine. Uh -huh. Yeah, it's, it's getting on towards a year. Well, they seem to be in good hands because well, they were swinging you. tonight with Joe. <laughs> I appreciate that. When did you uh, realize that maybe you could make a living as a trombone player? Well, I started playing trombone when I was 13 years old, and um, I was too dumb to understand what it really took to be a professional musician. If I had known, I probably would have had, if I had that much brains, I would have quit. Yeah. But it, it's a very difficult profession, and as you go along, you find out that most of the people in the profession really shouldn't be in it, you know what I mean? Because it is really difficult. I mean, I, what, l let me rephrase that. I shouldn't say it shouldn't be in it. But uh, it to be what you expect of us in this particular level, mm -hmm. It's very difficult. I mean, it, and and so many people don't quite reach it, and they want to, and they try, and you know, it's not about that. And they work, and they work, and they work. But if I had known the requirements, I, I would have probably had better sense. From not just a talent standpoint, but from other aspects. Well, too? everything, it, everything, kind of, kind of pushes into it, you know what I mean? There's a lot of people that really want to do well in music, but uh, it's just not their thing. They really want, you know, it's glamorous and it's, it's, mm -hmm. music is fun, yeah. let's face it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know, It's a lot of work, you know, and we go through a lot of pain on the one that, but music is fun, it's great camaraderie. Yeah. And then when you really like to play and you're around a bunch of guys that can really play, they bring, you know, they bring, you know, further, seem, you seem to improve just, you know, Point around with, this kind right. of talent, you know what I mean? I mean, it's great, but there's, and there's some people that get involved and they really frustrate themselves and they don't really get up to the line. I'm not maligning uh, anybody mm -hmm. in particular, but I'm just saying, after being out here 40 years like I have been, mm -hmm. more, more, if I tell the truth, it'd be 50. <laughs> I've seen a lot of people come and go, and uh, you know, in other words, you start to understand what the requirements are. Yeah, and it can be awesome. I mean, there are lesser bands. I mean, you know that uh, 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 in which lesser people thrive pretty well. But this thing is scary when you get into it, and, and when you finally make it, and you say, "My goodness, it seems what like I got myself it, into." It seems like a fine line too between <clears throat> being pretty good and, and getting to that next level. And I, when you've got a whole band like you do of, of excellence, it, 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 you can really tell. Well, well, thank you. And uh, I, you said it better than I did what I, I was trying, <laughs> trying to say. Yeah, it's, um, it's um, you feel good when you can survive amongst this level of people. You mm -hmm. really go home and say, wow, 
you know, a few pinches, and you know, it's me. I did it. I'm doing it. You know what I mean? Well, when we, I went out the stage door earlier, and I saw your bus. It's a pretty good-looking bus. Yeah. How has being on the road changed from oh. 1995, from years oh. ago? Oh. The jet plane. You can close New York and open Stockholm. You know what I mean? Yeah. You can leave Paducah, Kentucky, and play a one-nighter in L.A. The jet plane has really put yeah. another dimension in, 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 into, uh, into this thing. You know, we, we do great distances. Yeah. And uh, in short amounts of time. It's, it's not unusual, you know, to leave uh, New York at 8 o'clock in the evening and, and, uh, and the next evening you, you're going on stage in London or Moscow or, or Paris. Mm -hmm. So the jet plane has really, you know, has really... Uh, I, and that's international, but it, it, this huge country, <clears throat> you know, how you can't appreciate how big the United States is until, until you do go right. outside the United States. Because the distance from New York to uh, San Francisco is about the same as from New York to London or Paris. And so it's just as difficult to go from New York to San Francisco as it is to go from mm -hmm. New York to London. But then yeah. when you start thinking in terms of that you're going to another country and another yeah. continent, you know, it sounds further. But, wow, the distances in the United States itself mm -hmm. are great. I did, I did today. I got up at 4 o'clock in the morning in New York and did a one letter here in Sarasota mm -hmm. this evening. Yeah. We've had a longer day oh, than yeah. I thought. It's, oh, yeah, <laughs> yeah, it's been. Yeah. Yeah, it's been long. Yeah. The Basie groups that you played with had some marvelous players and some of the best, I think, yeah. ensembles that he had. Yeah, who were you who were your favorite word. bandmates? Well, we had some genius level people. You know, this was. Ellington's band and Basie's band, the one thing that caused them, in some ways, to be at the ability level that we were able to maintain, was we, in the older days, and prior to 1964, we couldn't get jobs in, in, in studios, you know, we couldn't play at the, at the networks and all that. And so, Ellington and Basie had access to the greatest black musicians alive. Mm -hmm. In other words, that's what we had to aspire to. And you couldn't think of going to NBC or ABC or, or being a Hollywood student, which later I did, you know, uh, and, and, and quite successfully. But in those days, they had access to the greatest black musicians available, the greatest. And so they had their choice. And that, <laughs> that's, 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 that's something. You that's know. A, a really important statement. I, yeah. I haven't heard it put quite that I way. I know, most people won't yeah. say it. They're afraid uh -huh. to say it, but I know it because, I, you know, we would sit there and our greatest competition was each other because mm -hmm. we, uh, we, you know, we, until Clark Terry and those guys in 1964 and yeah. 63 started getting into uh, the networks and all that kind of stuff, it, it was... There was a couple guys here right. and there, you know, but uh, CBS was pretty good. They had a guy over there in New York, a contractor named Lou Shuby. He was quite fair. Mm -hmm. And so some guys got jobs. But for the most part, you couldn't even dream of getting in, in one of those studio jobs. It was just unheard of mm -hmm. in those days. Was there problems uh, in different parts of the country going into... Well, there was With problems them. everywhere in the country. You know, they, they pointed a finger at the South. No, the, the South was, uh, was so obvious, you know what oh. I mean? But the, the same problems existed everywhere. Now, you've got to realize that the centers of communication uh, of, uh, of media was uh, New York and Chicago and, and, uh, and Los Angeles, you know. And mm -hmm. there's nothing South about any of those, you know right. what I mean? But um, um, socially, you know, this country has been very strange in that sense. I mean, yeah. uh, uh, to be kind, you know, it's just, it just, it just got off to a bad start, and we still suffer from that. You see, black people came out of slavery, mm -hmm. and slavery was an ugly institution, and they, the general population had to excuse slavery to themselves by saying that we were these terrible, inferior people. 
and this has been passed on and on and on. And this was, I mean, they had to tell themselves they were doing us a favor to, to uh, you know, to put you into bondage. And that uh, was a big deal. And, uh, and a lot of that is still here. You know, we just finally got to the place where guys could play quarterback on professional yeah. football yeah. teams. And they had themselves talked into this thing yeah. saying that they couldn't play these so-called uh, intelligence positions, you know, which is crazy. The or, most awesome thing you'll ever come into is a human being and the human mind. I don't care what kind of man it is, mm -hmm. you know, what color or what nationality. The, it's an awesome thing, yeah. you know, and we're all equally stupid and equally mm -hmm. smart. It seems to take too long. It seems to take you know, oh, too yeah, long. Oh, yeah, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's, it, it continues to be a, a problem. Mm -hmm. It's convenient for some people, and, 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 and the thing is, the separation has caused um, people not to think of you. You know what I mean, not to think of you? In other words, uh, uh, because people are separated from one another, if, for instance, if you were with one group and if you were in a power group or something like that, I don't care how much you might think of me, you would have to reach outside your group to think of me. I mean, it's not that you are a bad person. But this, this process of thinking of me would be very difficult for you. So that's what really happens. We're not thought into the process. Mm -hmm. we're, not, we're never thought into the process. The only thing that was ever planned for us uh, uh, in this country was slavery. And, 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 and everything else has been a huge battle, I mean, to prove that you could do something uh, other uh -huh. than this, you know. And, uh, uh, even now, you know, you always have to make this great effort. You still hear people say, oh, the first black guy to yeah. manage a baseball team, yeah. the first guy to, black guy to play in the 70s. It's yeah. 1996. Right. You know, and they're, and they're still at this, at this place. And that's because of the structure of society. You know, everybody's not mean. Everybody's not mean about this. And there's some people, I mean, I'm uh, speaking from the point of view of a pretty well experienced 66-year-old man. Some people want to be your friend, but they don't have, a ner they don't have enough nerve. They're, they got so much pressure from the outside. You know what I mean? You can almost see them waving from the crowd saying, uh, you know, well, you know, you're a pretty good guy, but I can't, I can't do it. Uh, that's, that's, you know, just the way it is. It has to change. The world's too small. What do you make of the fact that um, festivals like, like this one, when uh, the audience seems to be almost totally white, well, again, we're back to the, uh, the this social structure and and the social division, and then uh, you got to figure that most black people are poor and they they, they can't afford it. And <laughs> that's a fact. And uh, 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 the funny thing about it is, like we're talking about, jazz came out of the black community. But the people that don't know anything about jazz, and the first one to say, "I never heard of Count Basie or Charlie Parker," is a black person. Mm -hmm. You know, they're, they're, somehow or another, they, and, and they're, they're, uh, it's just, it's the, it's the media structure and the, and the, and the huge um, warehousing in these areas and neighborhoods and all that kind of stuff. It creates dumb stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you've been a part of uh, some of the greatest music making, and uh, what was it like playing with Duke? Oh, no, yeah, he was, he was great. <laughs> <laughs> no, dude, he, was a, he was something else, man. He was... He was, he was really bright, you know, he was a special case. Yeah. You know, I'd have to sit here a week to tell you about yeah. Duke Ellington, you know. I could tell you a lot about Basie, but Duke was, uh, Duke was great. He was, he was great. He was a great, uh, now we got another one, Quincy Jones, but <laughs> these guys were great at, yeah. you know, pulling people together and pulling talent together and making yeah. things happen, you know. These guys could really see this little tiny thing in one guy that would, re and they really magnify mm -hmm. it and all of a sudden, you know, you might, under somebody else's handling, you would never hear of that side of maybe mm -hmm. some particular artist. Now, Quincy, he's out there on the West Coast. He'll make, he'll make an album or something like that, and he'll hear some specific guy that you would never think of, and he'll fly him all the way from New York to, to, to uh, 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 L.A. to maybe like Al Gray, uh, you know, just to play one solo on one track. Yeah. But then when the thing gets together, nobody stops to think of, of, of how he amalgamated all of these uh, individuals and these little things into this one, you know, they hear the album as a whole, but right. but he's a thinker, and Duke was like that. He knew what every person could do and yeah. what their strong oh, point yeah. was. He, exactly, yeah. exactly, and he just blended them into into this Ellington uh, Olio. I heard he had his own uh, 
method of discipline. <laughs> or <laughs> lack of, I don't know. Yeah, well, he was, look, let me tell you, I was in that band one time, and uh, just to give you, I, I guess we'll call it an anecdote. Yeah. Uh, the first night, I lived in San Francisco area. We had left uh, Monterey Jazz Festival. The Monterey Jazz Festival, this was the second year for the month. It was the, uh, 1960, I guess it was. And uh, we got to San Francisco, and there was a club that we played and owned by the DuPonts called the Neve. And the first night was just absolutely gorgeous. The band just roared. This was my first night with these people, see? And the second night, everybody was late. It seemed like everybody was late. There was a nucleus in his band that was always on town. You could always figure you would see Lawrence Brown. You know, he was very dapper, and he was sitting there never late and all that stuff. And, and uh, oh, Boone Mullins was a trumpet player there, and, and the rhythm section pretty much would be there. And so some of the guys are out milling around in the audience, you know what I mean? Here I am in, 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 my, in what was my hometown then, uh, trying to make this big impression. You know, I was really embarrassed, you know what I mean? So I told Duke, you know, he had this funny old uh, medley or something like that that he could play with two or three guys on the stand and he would go through this act, you know, ladies and gentlemen, we've been successful in, in, over the years and, and you go into these, these unison type things with maybe six people up there. So I told him, I said, wow, I said, Duke, I said, man, this is terrible. This is embarrassing. I all my friends, and he says, he says, look, I don't worry about these people. Number one, these people are not going to drive me crazy. He says, I live for the night that this band is great. Tonight means nothing to me. I said, oh, how can you say that? You know, so we're going to hear these guys milling around. And, and yeah, Jimmy Hamilton was sitting there, he was playing, and, and I was, you know, I'm all upset, you know, and I said, Jimmy, look at all these people walking around out here, and uh, we should be up on the bandstand playing, you know. He looks at me like I'm crazy, and the waiter comes up to the bandstand and says, Mr. Hamilton, your steak is ready. And right in the middle of the tune, he steps over the, he steps over the rail, starts cutting on a steak. And so, <laughs> so about a week later, we were playing at a, a uh, Air Force Base outside of uh, Sacramento called Mather Air Force Base. Now, there's no place to go. So here's this band, and they got to play. There's no place for these guys to fool around. It's, you know, this whole military atmosphere. So the band is just roaring. Beautiful. And so I hear the piano player do, I'm saying, ding, 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 ding. Ding, 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 ding. You know, and so I looked around, and he's over, and he said, see what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> So oh, that's, that's where priceless. he was. He was oh, he, yeah. I mean, he, nothing bothered him. Uh -huh. But you couldn't do that with Basie. Mm. Nothing bothered him. You walk into Basie's band late, and you walk up on that bandstand, and you know the very fastest solo possible, your cold, you're going to play right then. <laughs> he had all kinds of ways, all kinds yeah. of ways of punishing you, you yeah. know what I mean? Oh, he, he was just mean. Or some tight solo you know darn well you can't play. Uh -huh. Uh, 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 you know, because you haven't warmed up, you know, and, or some high ballad or something like that, you got to play it right there on the spot. He doesn't say anything. Yeah, he didn't call you out. Yeah, you're messing it up, you know, and then he's, he's just sitting over there. If you say anything, they say, well, that's your job. You're supposed to be. That's your yeah. solo. <laughs> A lot to be learned from that. That's right. Oh, he was, he was, he was something. Else. He was great, though. I really loved hearing the... Uh, Chunk, chunk of that acoustic guitar. Tonight. Oh, Freddie! You know, oh, is, yeah. yeah. But he had so much character yeah. to that band. Yeah. He really, you know, we still try. We we have a very good guitarist now. We, we whom we've only had for about well eight or nine months, mm -hmm. and uh, we're pretty close to getting back to that feel. Yeah. Because you know we got a bunch of people now. You know that play guitar. They're usually yeah. a, learn to play electric guitar. Uh, solid body guitars with the, that you can't even hear unless they amplify them through. Mm -hmm. But this kid is really good. But Freddie, he really, really had this particular sound, you know, and this this metronomic ability to yeah. play good time. And he, he was special. I've always wondered how the, um, how were the solos spread around in the, in the bassy band? Well, everything was kind of not on purpose. You just kind of, you, you just kind of grew. In other words, you have a 
a character. If you were, to, do you play? Yes. You have a character about you. Uh, you either can play something really pretty, or you can play something really fast, or um, and you can. Some of these things you know you can do better than others, and these guys they can figure this out. And you are usually going to be playing something that you're pretty strong at. Mm -hmm. I, you know, I was pretty high player and I had a pretty tone, so I was always expected to play the ballads. He, in fact, he never let me play jazz. I wanted, I wanted to play. Mm -hmm. I wanted to be hot. No, mm -hmm. no, he said, no, 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 no. He would always say, "You're a trombonist." Not a trombone player. You're, I want you to play, uh, be a trombonist. <laughs> and I was, you know, I wanted to roar. But then, I, you know, I played lead and yeah. you know, did my little Tommy Dorsey act. But, you know, as I look back, you know, it was a career-saving thing. It, because mm -hmm. when you do have some facet of your uh, style or whatever it is magnified, you know, in, in these bands, the whole world hears you. Yeah. yeah. Basie had a way of uh, tailoring arrangements to... Oh, yeah. Keep it his sound. Yeah, what he did, uh, a good example of that was uh, Little Darling. When Neil brought Little Darling in, it was supposed to be fast. Did you know that? No, I didn't. It was da 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 And basically, oh my, it's, it's a nice song, but it's terrible and slowed it way. Da, 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 da. That's how Little Darling got that. And there was a couple more he did that way. And then he could do just the opposite with something that, that was maybe would play faster. Mm -hmm. He was very good at tempos. Now, you see, he came through that uh, that uh, vaudeville school, you know, with the dancers and all that kind of stuff, and he had really good insight. A lot of that sparse piano style is came from accompanying dancers, if you can mm -hmm. remember how piano players used to accompany tap dancers. Oh. So he, this was, you see what I mean? It's just yeah. a removal from that yeah. and, and, uh, and, uh, and uh, taking advantage of this real sparse mm -hmm. musical type of thing with a band. If you can imagine the piano player that had to come and he tap dances, Basie was the mm -hmm. perfect example of that. That's how that little plink mm -hmm. here and the plink there yeah. got to be part of. Yeah. Well, it, to a great degree, got to be yeah. part of what he was doing. He was a vaudevillian, you know. That must have been quite an experience for an arranger to, you know, work on something and keep hearing this. Uh, here's how it goes in my head, and yeah. come in and say, "No, not that's like right." That. And it turns totally into something else. Yeah. Marshall Roy was pretty good at that too. You mm -hmm. know, Marshall was very bright. You know, he was a very fine lead alto player, very gruff. Uh, but he was he was a genius, very gruff, beautiful sound. He was just a, one of the most natural musicians I mm -hmm. ever encountered. They call him Straw Boss. So yeah, well, he was. Yeah, we called him the Field Marshal, oh. the Burgermeister. <laughs> 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 that was his whole attitude and everything. But he but he could back it up. Yeah, yeah, he was great. Everybody seemed to get nicknames along the way. Somehow. Oh yeah, oh yeah, we. We still do that. Yeah, what's yours? <laughs> I'm not going to tell no, you. Okay. Fair enough. Fair enough. <laughs> My goodness. And, and Joe comes together with a band. Oh yeah. Two times that, a year, you, right? you notice how you notice how, how natural it is when he does come in. Yeah. Oh no no. Joe Joe was a very very big part of the comeback of this band. You know the big mm -hmm. band business had really frittered down pretty well in the fifties, and Joe was a huge huge factor in the resurgence of this band. I would be remiss to tell you different. Yeah. And he was, and the old man never forgot that, and he was always very, you know, appreciative of the facts that how important Joe was to that uh, stage of the career. And right. Joe, uh, Joe is another genius level vocalist. He, he, you can't lose him. He's, you know, he's, I think he could do grand opera as well as he does what what you see us doing here. It's a natural singer, like yeah. Sarah Vaughan was the same way. I think Joe could do Pagliacci just as easy as he can do the blues. I almost heard that in the Here's to Life tonight. Oh, yeah, no, he's, no he, oh, he's a vocalist. Wow. Oh, he is a musician, you know. And he has great ears, you can't lose him. Mm -hmm. He can sing the slowest tempos, and the fastest things, you know, he's great. How do, when you pick from uh, your book of arrangements, how much? How many charts do you usually work out of? Uh, well, we carry about 300 with us, <laughs> <laughs> and I try to make things flow. Yeah. You know what I mean? I try to mix a certain amount of things that people want to hear, and you know that uh, it's uh, it's like standard repertoire. You you know they want to hear Abel in Paris and Little Darling. Yeah. One o'clock, John Corner Pocket. So you have to. I I, I tried to 
blend them into a um, combination of good arrangements that works within the framework of what this band is all about at the same to keep the musicians interested and from, uh, mm -hmm. from getting on board and, and, and doing the, trying to do a service to uh, the splitting the difference between the audience and something very interesting, something swinging. And you have to keep, these, these are very, very bright people and you have to keep them interested. You, you know how children are who are very bright in school and, and if you aren't careful they lose interest in, well that's what these people are. You have to challenge them all the time. You know, if you start just playing the same old easy things every night and just just making the job, you, you're going to get in big trouble. And you're going to get a lot of yawning and a, and a lot of uh, lack of concentration. Mm -hmm. So I try to make it flow. You know, I make mistakes. You know, I make mistakes. I don't. I don't know. It doesn't always come off. But uh, yeah. I've been lucky. You enjoy being the leader. Yes, I got right to the place where I just figured I was the leader. I didn't want to do anything else. I had my own band after I left this yeah. band. And uh, I feel that I grew into this role. Mm -hmm. I mean, I know that might sound a little bit. Not at all. I don't, I don't want it to sound arrogant, but I didn't want to be a sideman anymore. I figured mm -hmm. that what I was able to do now, my contribution was, could be better as a leader. Mm -hmm. I think I know what I'm doing. And I think my long apprenticeship has pretty well prepared me for this. I'll drink to that. <laughs> well, thank you. <laughs> what, um, where's the band heading tomorrow? In, Across state. Mexico? We're going to, we're going uh, around uh, Orlando, and then we're going up into Georgia, and then we're going to go up into the Carolinas and Hilton Head and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. Same old stuff. Yeah. yeah. Same old bus. But let me tell you, I still enjoy it. It's still fun. As long as the music is good and the guys can play, it can really be fun. Sometimes I get so tired, I say to myself, what the hell am I still doing this for? But just you go out and some kid will just burn right through some great solo and there's your answer right there. <laughs> just like Duke said. Yeah, that's, that's <laughs> it. Yeah, no, yeah, he, was, he was something, boy. That yeah. Duke Ellington was wow. really something. Going overseas anytime soon. Yeah, we uh, we will probably spend the whole month of July in Japan, and uh, before that we'll go. We we've got some, I noticed on the uh, itinerary we've got some jazz festival in Denmark we're right. going to play, and there's some talk that we're going to go to St. Petersburg, Russia for one day because we do things like that. Oh yeah, they do. We went to Russia oh six months ago and we stayed there a week and played three days. Mm -hmm. So we're, we're always, uh, and, and last year, in 1995, we spent most of the year out of the country. Mm -hmm. France, Spain, Portugal, Italy. Yeah, it was, it was, yeah. A, it was a year And everybody knows travel. the Basie Band around yeah, the world. Yeah, well, you know, it's a funny thing. Uh, <clears throat> Americans are pretty blasé music-wise and entertainment-wise. You know, they got everything. But we can walk down the street in, in some... European capitals and especially Asian places, and kids can know who you are, we'll recognize you on the street. Japan, Thailand, and it, it was like that in Sweden and Germany and, and England, because you know they're getting very Americanized and they're getting very blase too, <laughs> but uh, but they still are more interested in this thing that, that they, you know, they uh, Americans are just beginning to understand it or look into jazz as a very serious music that it is. Like Duke Ellington used to say, jazz is the most serious music you can ever get involved in. And Europeans always gave us that respect. To them, it was a serious uh, act that you were in. You were a serious artist. And Americans were, well, you were kind of a clown, you know. And it was, you know, they, could, they never equated us or looked at us uh, as people on the concert stage. They always, they always kind of visualized you in the smoky club, you know, and all yeah. that kind of stuff. Yeah. And uh, uh, you were just kind of a character of the evening. But uh, we're deadly serious, well-trained, highly experienced musicians, artists. And uh, like Duke says, there's no musician more serious than a jazz musician or has to do more work. It's very difficult, you know, in terms of the spontaneity that's required. Well, well put. And, uh I know you have to get up and get on that bus in the morning. Yes, <laughs> early. 
This has been absolutely fascinating, and uh, I can't wait for our students to, to listen to some of the things Well, I hope said. I said something to make some kind of sense or that's interesting Excellent. to somebody, yeah. you know, and I, I thank you for having me. I, well, really, I really enjoyed really this really pleased you were able to come on behalf of Hamilton College. I'd well, like to thank Grover Mitchell for joining us. It's been a great pleasure. It's been a pleasure thank for you. me. Thank you. Thank you.